Welcome in. This is The Herd. What's that Colin says every day? Wherever you may be, however you may be listening to the show, thanks so much for making us part of your day. Christina Pink alongside our cast of hundreds who helped prepare this show. I appreciate all the hard work they have put in to make me look decent, especially hair and makeup. I look like Montgomery Burns five minutes ago. Now, hey, huh? Huh? My wife didn't underachieve so badly. Uh, Christine, of course, just down to uh, little egg whites, turkey sausage, right? Whole uh, whole wheat toast. Whole is grain toast. Whole grain toast. And um, some coffee. And coffee. Coffee. coffee without, like, any sort of additive. So we're, I am caffeinated. I am ready. We're all kind of ready for football season. Nothing gets you more ready for football season than what happened in the SEC last night. The most SEC Southern thing ever happened at Ole Miss. I want to get to that in a moment. Um, Eric Davis will join us on set here. Three-time All-Pro Super Bowl champion. I want to talk about Mike. Mike Vick, who's uh, more known for making people miss on the field. Suddenly, he was backpedaling yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show. Eric Dickerson, one of the great all-time running backs. We'll talk about O.J. Simpson, who in October will be released from prison on parole. Talk about O.J. and how delusional he appeared to be and what that, how we view O.J.'s parole hearing yesterday. Plus, Joel Klatt will join us, of course, uh, our lead analyst, on Fox Sports and Fox Sports 1 covering college football. We'll get his take on what's happening and what has happened in Oxford, Mississippi. Let, let's begin there, shall we? Listen, uh, I, I want to make sure I point out that I am not trying to make fun of the South, but it's getting way, way too easy, okay? This one's just, this one's low-hanging fruit. It just is. And I would also like to point out that I... I have a great affinity for the South, for Oxford, Mississippi. It's a cool town, man. Uh, it's not what you, it's actually far more progressive than you think. Uh, and the downtown area is amazing. And the Grove is not just a cool place to hang out pregame, but it's kind of one of those uh, destinations that once in your life, you have to check the box, go to a football game on the Grove, which of course leads you into the stadium where Ole Miss plays. And, I, I went to Oklahoma State, which is not quite the South, not quite the Midwest, not quite the Southwest, but it does have some of the similar. There, there's a lot of similarities in Oklahoma to parts of the South. And my wife's from there, in-laws are from there, friends are from there. I have lived there. I consider it a second home. That said, what are th- the three things that we always, that, that we as non-Southerners think about the South? All right, there's like, there's that, hey, you lost, you lost the Civil War. Like, you do know you lost. <laughs> it's over. It's been over for a long time. And yet, the rest of us seem to have moved on. Others are kind of stuck in that, how do we recognize generals for, uh, for the Union? Like, dude, you lost. You don't need statues. It, the Confederate flag is not a good thing. It's not a great representation of where you were at that point in time. There is no Southern pride for the rest of us. Um. You still kind of bought into the idea of unhealthy food. But seven of the eight fattest states are in the South. Also, seven of the eight states where people smoke the most also in in the South. Seven of eight SEC states are the fattest states in the union. Like, look, I like fried food. I like fried chicken. I like fried fish. I never really got into the whole chicken fried steak thing or the chicken fried chicken, which shouldn't that just be fried chicken? That seems to be like Department of Redundancy Department. But um, while some of us, like in the rest of the contiguous of 48, right, in, in, the, in the lower 48, most of us, we only have that type of food during state fair time that is part of the daily fair or weekly fair in parts of the South. Like in SEC country, kale is still a garnish. But I think maybe the biggest part of... of uh, of what makes the South the South is many of us have, we haven't moved on from religion. We're still very spiritual, but we're more secular than religious, right? There's a spirit to it. There's, there's, a, there's a pride to still having religion, but you can't necessarily lead with religion. And I think that's actually part of the story to which makes us go, aha, another Southerner who tweets out Bible verses talks about God, talks about Jesus, and then is apparently misdialing for a minute a number in Detroit, which links to a 
Tampa escort service? Like, Hugh, Hugh Freeze is not even a good liar. Right? That, like, that's not even a good lie. Wait, so I, I called, oh, wrong number, what butt dial, who dis, like all of these, like, you don't misdial a number from a different area code. You misdial a number that you miss by a number, right? Or I thought it was a number for a recruit, turns out to be an escort service I was had. I was hacked. And I mean, a lot of us should have seen this coming. I think most of us did see it coming. There's the idea that, that Ole Miss was, they say, if you ain't cheating, you're trying. They've been trying really hard. Remember in 2000, was it, you know, when they tried to save his original recruiting class, when they had Laquan Treadwell, uh, when he had Robert Kim Dietschy, when he had Laramie Tunsil, that was when he first got there. Like Ole Miss getting far and away the number one recruiting class in the country is like the kid who has the answers to the test getting 100%. Like, don't get 100%. Like, every, you're supposed to, like, miss a couple of questions so that if you're normally a C or D student, it, 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 it raises up everybody's antennas when you get 100. You get an 89, you get a 91, and now all of a sudden you kind of get a pass on it. Instead, Ole Miss was just throwing dudes out there. Two years ago, Ole Miss played my alma mater, Oklahoma State, in the Sugar Bowl. Hey, Oklahoma State was a good team, probably overachieved, won some close games. Um, by you, know, you could have seen a way in which maybe they should have been in the college football playoff, but the reality of their talent was they were not at the level of the top five teams in the country. They played against Ole Miss. It was a complete and total mismatch in terms of talent. Okay? And Mike Gundy even said something about it. And to everyone else in America, it's like, dude, Ole Miss throwing out all those dudes against Oklahoma State, two programs that traditionally are also rans in their conference and now have elevated to the elites of the conference, but the difference in talent tells you Ole Miss is cheating. Right? And then we had the Laramie Tunsil being drafted, and of course, one of the great photos of all time, which was the, the bong photo or the, the video that went viral was on Twitter the, the, during the NFL, like, then after the NFL draft, when Tunsil falls in the draft, they asked him about text messages that were also put out there on social media, and he admits to getting paid by uh, Hugh Freeze and his staff. Like, all of this thing is a bizarre story, but it also plays down to that low-hanging fruit of SEC. We know they're cheating. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. The things we think about. So, maybe it's that the second somebody leads with the Bible, we th our antennas are up. Maybe it's that we have, it's not a negative image. Well, there's some negative image or there's some, there's some stereotype, negative stereotypes about the South that the rest of us have. But this is the most SEC story ever. I mean, also factor in that the, the reason that Hugh Freeze was brought down was because their former coach, Houston Nutt, I should point out an Oklahoma State alum as well. Houston Nutt was named in the, their NCA infractions findings by the school as if Houston Nuts issues as a head coach that they caused most of the infractions. Had, had Hugh Freeze and his staff simply apologized for naming Houston Nutt and putting the blame there, none of this would have happened. It, there's, there's a similarity here to Mike Vick, who we've been talking about all week. Like one of the parts of the Mike Vick story that goes unspoken now 10 years later is that when, when it first came out, he was connected to a dogfighting ring. He met with Roger Goodell, and he denied having anything to do with it. Had he simply come out in a private meeting with Roger Goodell and said, listen, my boys have this going. I got caught up in this web. Can you help me out of it? There's probably a pretty good chance that he wouldn't have been out of the NFL for that period of time, and a very good chance he wouldn't have gone to jail for it. And had... Had Hugh Freeze, and this is not jail worthy, this is more morality, and in in there's there's maybe also a side interesting discussion as to uh, would you rather have your head coach have escorts or would you rather have your head coach have a mistress? Like it's a it's a it's the world's oldest profession. They are professionals, it's kind of a clean transaction. Granted, he's dumb enough to do it on his work phone, which just shows May either arrogance or simply uh, ambivalence. But um, the idea that Houston Nutt 
could have allowed this to go away, and his lawyers went in for the kill. And Houston Nutt was fired at Arkansas before he got to Ole Miss for over 2,000 text messages to a local reporter. Right, like this has happened before in the SEC, and it actually happened with Houston Nutt, who Houston Nutt and his lawyers helped bring down Hugh Freeze. And oh yeah, by the way, then there's the other kind of salacious details too. The reason that Houston Nutt uh, lost his job, and the reason that Houston Nutt was named in these in findings, and they tried to to sully his name, was that Hugh Freeze was calling other reporters and being an unnamed source and talking off the record, to which they have phone records for, saying Houston Nutt did this, he was doing that, he was doing the other thing. Like Hugh Freeze, bad guy. Hugh Freeze operating a, pro- a football program which everyone in the world knew. You don't get dudes like that. The depth of talent they get, unless they're cheating, ultimately brought down by a <clears throat> misdial to an escort service. A league that gave us Bobby Petrino and the motorcycle ride and the, the neck brace and the, 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 road, the, the, uh, the road rash. A league that gave us Houston Nut text messaging. A local reporter is the same league that gives us Cam Newton and the dad that wants money from Mississippi State and then somehow ends up at Auburn and Cam Newton's dad is banned from going to Auburn games, still shows up and Cam Newton somehow avoids any sort of NCAA penalties. Right? The league that gave us Johnny Manziel is the same league that gives us Hugh Freeze, escort service. And oh yeah, by the way, it happens in Florida. Or I know, Christina, that's where you went to school and you are an SEC Don't alum. Go there. A Don't prou- go there. A proud SEC alum. But if there's ever a story to which it's a bizarre story, the first thing you think is Dateline has to be Florida. Oh, man. We just. I can't tell you what I love more SEC or the fact that it's in Florida or the fact that it gets me so ready for football season. And then, like, now they're talking about, hey, maybe Les Miles should replace him. This is the same. And, again, it's a very SEC story. Two years ago, last game of the season, Les Miles is fired before the game begins. Then he goes out and gets a rounding, a rousing applause. Nobody wants to fire Les, so they keep him for another year, only then to fire him midseason. Only in the SEC, where it uh, <clears throat> matters more, right? Maybe it matters too much. We love you, SEC football, but we love you because sometimes it's just too easy. And today it's just too easy. Hi, everybody. It's Colin. You know I love Perky Jerky. So much so, I invested in it. Different, crazy good flavors. Jammin' Jamaican, sweet and snappy, original. Why do you have to choose? There's no fun in that. The new variety pack is a jerky lover's dream. Fans need choices, too. Otherwise, life and sports gets boring real fast. Try a different flavor every game. Special offer, 40% off all multi-packs. Please use the code HERD. It's the best-tasting jerky on earth, guaranteed. Get it at perkyjerky.com, code HERD. There's a famous quote from uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, that it is better for 100 guilty persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer. Of course, it talks about our our system of government and our our justice system specifically. That's from Ben Franklin in 1785. Who would have thought we would bring that up in talking on a sports radio show? Good morning to you, uh, wherever you may be listening to the show. Christina Pink alongside. We'll get to her with the news. Um, Eric Davis, of course, Super Bowl champion, three-time Pro Bowler, will join us uh, upcoming in about 15 minutes as well. Eric Dickerson, the show. Joel Klatt on the show to come. And I, I use that Ben Franklin quote to give you my, my honest belief that a good thing happened yesterday in Nevada. A, a good thing happened yesterday in Nevada. And while you say, wait, a, somebody who you believe, I do believe, okay, he was found to be not guilty in a court of law. He was found to be um, liable in a civil court for the death of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. And my heart aches for those two families, Right. Just aches for them. It's 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 awful. But the 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 sad fact is that our justice system, though flawed, okay, is still the best in the world. Right? It, to me, a, a lot of, the justice system is a lot like NBA officiating. Right? Like before the NBA playoffs or during the NBA playoffs, Adam Silver will come out and say, you know, we got the best officials in the world. And you're like, they're awful. Then I just coached overseas. I coached in Israel, FIBA officials. And you're like, you know what? They're actually way better than those clowns. (laughs) So, yes, NBA officials are not perfect. And 
some of them are not particularly good. They're way better than college refs. They're way better than FIBA refs. They just are. They just are. And our system of government, our justice system, has flaws. It is not perfect. Right? Sometimes juries can find verdicts that even judges are sitting up there going, what were they just listening to for the last two months, right? But, uh, like NBA officiating, it is better than anywhere else. And so, like, I, don't, I want O.J. Simpson to, to spend the rest of his life burning in hell for what he did. I do. But I also don't want a justice system that trumps up a charge for stealing his own stuff to where he spends his life behind bars when you wouldn't do that for any other criminal that committed the exact same offense. That's like, that's not who we want. I don't believe that's not who we want to be. He's going to suffer eternal damnation. Like you don't have to worry about that. Big fella upstairs. You believe they're going to take care of itself. And I understand he'll find a way to get to Florida. If Florida accepts him, and they can, they can shake him down for a lot of things, but they can't get to his pension. And so he's going to have money and he's going to have a, a decent lifestyle. And he can search for the real killers on golf courses in the state of Florida for the rest of his life. You know, like, again, you don't like it. Take it up with Florida. That's their state laws. That's why criminals can't do, in fact, go there when they have pension plans that they can protect. But I kind of think it was actually a good thing for our justice system. And... If you actually watched that pro hearing, first of all, I don't know how you felt about it outside of like a, a law and order episode or Shawshank Redemption or other. Like, I can't remember ever watching, ever watching a pro hearing before. Have you, have you? So it was really telling. It was interesting. He wasn't in front of the parole board. He was, it was like via satellite. Right? They were, they're 90 miles away. And so the guy with the chief's tie, like it wasn't. Like he wasn't sitting in front of the guy with the chief's tie. He was sitting in front of a group of people. And then there was, so I, I think that my big takeaway is one, for our justice system, that's the right thing to do. It might not feel good. It might feel terrible. It might feel like justice wasn't served. But that's not who we necessarily want to be to keep holding a guy in jail for stealing his, his own stuff for more than nine years. Um, and I thought there was at least a moment where O.J., like the O.J. Simpson on TV, what, how am I supposed to act at the very end? His closing statement had some contrition. And I am sorry that things turned out the way they, they did. I uh, had no intent to commit a crime. We're all convicts. I'm a convict. Do your time and don't do anything to ex- extend your time. I uh, believe in this jury system. I will honor what the jury said. I'd just like to get back to my family and friends. And believe it or not, I do have some real friends. I, I thought I was glad to get my stuff back, but it wasn't worth it. You know, nine years away from your family is just, just not worth it. And, now, and I, I, I'm sorry. If, if you listen to it, he didn't actually say, I'm sorry for what I did. He said, I'm sorry for how things turned out, right? Which is, there is really, it sounds like he's contrite. It sounds like he's sorry, but it's also OJ being OJ. But if you, you watch it in totality, there was some really strange moments where he almost slipped out of contrite OJ and went to defiant OJ. And he, he was, I think he was embodying the great philosopher, George Costanza, right? It's not a lie if you believe it. Here's OJ Simpson sounding like he did nothing wrong. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about victim empathy and alternative to violence and how it will benefit you in the future. Well, as I said, the alternative to, to, to violence courses, I've always thought I was, I've been pretty good with people and uh, I have basically have spent a conflict-free life. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a guy that ever got into fights on the street and uh, with the public and everybody. But. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a guy, like there was beating two wives. Of course, there was the double murder charge that he beat. Uh, but this is, this is OJ being OJ. It's what was the Edward Norton film that I'm thinking of where he was um, primal fear, right? Do you guys remember primal fear 
where the whole time he was just like, how is how is Edward Norton's character uh, being thought to be a murderer? And then at one point, at the, ver- the very last scene, Richard Gere knows that he just got a murderer to go free. And it, there's a double personality. There's there's two different people there. That's this is OJ. This is OJ the con man. OJ. This is OJ going like, hey, I basically lived a conflict free life. Like I have friends. I have real friends. I'm sorry for the way things turned out. I really am. This is OJ Simpson. Roy Firestone joined us yesterday on Speak for Yourself. Of course, Roy Firestone. For people who don't recall, you go back to when uh, the murders were committed, and he faced trial. The first interview and the biggest interview was Roy Firestone. And he was, he was the Larry King of sports interviews, right? Like remember Jerry Maguire? Um, uh, they, you know, everybody goes and cries on Roy Firestone. Sure enough, OJ Simpson sat down with Roy Firestone and was charming. And you would, if you watch that, you're like, OJ has nothing to do with this. You know, like he just, he, He has this ability to completely shut off any sort of level of accountability. And he's an incredibly believable con man. And that's actually what Roy said yesterday on Speak. We all bought that. I bought that in my interviews with him, too. I I believed him, too. I was conned by a con man. I'm not going to go back into that whole issue, what happened to me. But I, I bought it. I bought his lies. We all bought his lies. I mean, like, look, people in Penn State bought Jerry Sandusky's lies. Like, con men are able to, you know, uh, roam free because they're they're good at their lies. I mean, think think about how we look at the '90s or how we looked at the '90s at the time. How we look at them now. Right? Bill Cosby was America's father figure. Michael Jackson beloved by, and he just loved being around children. And O.J. Simpson was a picture of Americana. A football player became a broadcaster and a pitch man with a beautiful, uh, beautiful family and a couple of beautiful wives. Like that was O.J. Simpson. Remarkable con men who, who made us believe that they were something that they were not. And, and that's what you learned yesterday. In addition to that, the parole hearing was kind of a farce. Right, because anybody who had anybody who was actually on the parole board and really wanted to hear some sort of contrition, some sort of accountability, you know, he tried to retry the 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 theft case, right, the the kidnapping case to the parole board. Like he's already been in jail, he was already found guilty, he's been there for nine years. Let's not relitigate this case. And yet OJ, knowing that he's on camera, went into classic OJ mode. It's I don't even think he's bipolar. I think he's convinced himself that his reality is reality. And he's been able to con himself for so long, and he was able to con America for so long that he went back into classic con man OJ yesterday. But as Benjamin Franklin said, it's better for a hundred guilty men to walk free than for one innocent man to be jailed, right? Right. We don't want we don't want O.J. Simpson on the streets. Hey, we don't. Who wants O.J. Simpson on the streets? But if, if 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 the actual quote is, it's better for one hundred persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer. But for our justice system, you don't want a guy who stole his own stuff to be in jail for the rest of his life. That's the kind of thing that happens in third world countries. That's the kind of thing that we point that's that's the trumped up charges and, you know, make make believe kangaroo courts are the types of things that happen in South Africa. Okay, and I'm not trying to say that he's a sympathetic figure like Nelson Mandela, but we want our court system to be legitimate. And yesterday felt like a legitimate ruling if you took out the idea that we all believe, or most of us believe, he committed the double murder. He was found not guilty in that same court of law. This is the Herd Podcast. His hair is incredible, but his analysis is even better. He's our lead analyst for Fox Sports covering college football. He's Joel Klatt. 
and he joins us on the set here. What's up, man? On the herd, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? How was the How was the 405? Uh, it was good. It, w- it wasn't that bad today, so uh, it's a good day. Off, here off in hours LA. is off hours. It's not That's bad. Right. We'll see. We'll see. Getting back home. That's right. I had my own thoughts on Hugh Freeze. Yeah. And what happened? But I respect yours even more than my own. What was your reaction to not just that he was fired, but the reason which he was yeah. fired? Well, obviously, there's the specifics of the case. I thought that immediately when I when I heard it and dug into the actual so- story, what what this was was a combination of events that eventually led this this parting of a ways. Obviously, it's a resignation. He was going to get fired if he if he didn't resign. Um, I think that Hugh Freeze survives one of the two. But when you combine the 21 allegations of, of our uh, notice of allegations from the NCAA with this personal conduct issue uh, that pops up via the Houston nut lawsuit against Houston and, and Hugh Freeze, you don't survive both of them. OK, and and as bad as one or both could be, I think it was the combination that ultimately led them down this path where they were going to part ways. And that's actually a frustrating part because I think either should have been enough, but it really took the combination for them to arrive at this conclusion and ultimately part ways. And then there's the, the, the you mentioned the Houston nut and the lawsuit, which exposed this. And then you factor in that Houston nut was actually fired at, at, at Arkansas right. for the, the text messages that he had with a local reporter. Oh. Like it's just, it's just, ama- it's, ama- it's really amazing. Okay. So now the, the other overarching thoughts. So that was specific to the case, right. right? So if you wanted to, and this is, I love talking about this type of stuff, the overarching NCAA type things when it comes to situations like this. And I love talking about them with you because we actually tend to differ a lot in our opinion of, of, like what the players should be allowed to do right now. Sure. So, for instance, there's three things that I in, uh, initially thought of. First and foremost, the players. If uh, See, I personally believe that every player on the Ole Miss roster should be able to transfer without penalty immediately. Immediately. Because you don't commit to places, you commit to people. Anyone that's played college athletics will tell you that it was more about the staff and the head coach than it ever was about the facilities or the town or so on and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. So, I, Absolutely, in regards to I, I do believe because they're on NCAA probation, they were allowed to transfer without sitting out well, anyway. That that's that's actually the, that, that's there's actually there's nuances there because it's only however long the postseason ban is, right? If they get to the two year postseason ban, which they're not at right now, if they get to the two year postseason ban, then juniors and seniors can transfer. If that grows to a three year postseason ban, then you can include sophomores as well. Um, There have been a couple of exceptions that the NCAA has granted, rightly so. I think an exception should be granted on more cases. This is one of them. But you had the SMU case back in the 80s. Players were able to transfer without penalty. And then Penn State uh, was an instance in which players were able to transfer without penalty due to essentially a waiver given by the NCAA in those cases. I think that that should happen here, just like I thought it should have happened at Baylor. Um, So that's the first thing I thought of. And then secondly, it comes down to the institution. Doug, I'm a a firm believer believer that there are no shortcuts to success in college athletics and the problem is is that ultimate success is really not afforded every single program so you've got to know who you are before you know how and and where you're going to go this is a byproduct of old miss not understanding who they are in the pantheon of college football and in the pantheon of the sec because if you go back 20 25 years this program has constantly been in and out of turmoil based on trying to find short-term success when it's really not afforded their program you go back to this recruiting class of uh, that got them in trouble in this recent uh, cycle. Lacron Tre- Treadwell commits to Ole Miss without even going on a visit. Sure. It's like that's a red flag. Well, the whole the whole number one class at Ole Miss. Everybody's like, oh boy. But see, I actually, I'm gonna dis- shocker. I'm gonna disagree with you. I think they know exactly who they are. Right? Like I think <laughs> the, the I, team that has to do this in order to compete well, well, at the they, high they, level. Well, yes, yes. I mean, honestly, most people in the SEC will tell you that that uh, Mississippi State should be allowed to cheat. Mississippi State, right? Like, should be allowed. Like, right. they should get like, a waiver. It's like, yeah, you're like, dude, they got to be able to cheat. I mean, it's just because you can't compare Mississippi State with any other campus. Yeah, Stark um, feels bad. But I, I actually think Ole Miss knows exactly who they are, and they know that they are not Alabama, and by their own estimation, this is the only way to do it. Again, I don't think... 
I don't think that's how you should look at it. But if you say there's no shortcuts to success, that's not true. I saw them demolish my alma mater, Oklahoma State, two years ago in the Sugar Bowl. Why? They had better players. Why? Because they cheated to get all those players. I guess, I guess yes, that's short-term success. If you want that one year, if you think that that one year is worth it or beating Alabama two years in a row or, or that wonderful day in the Grove when they beat Alabama, if that's worth it to you, then go ahead and mortgage the fu- future it, of I, your I, organization. I don't think it is, but I think that's the thought process. That it goes they back can never, to my, They can never take that away from us. It, it goes back to my first point, okay, is that because the adults in the room want the short-term success and will mortgage anything to get there, and this goes back, this is a cycle for Ole Miss going back 22, 25 course, years. You can go all the way back. Because the adults in the room think that that's okay, guess who bears the brunt? The people that are going to bear the brunt of these actions are the current players who had no spot at the table to decide if this was the way that they wanted to go about business in the first place. That's my whole problem is that we're going to penalize now these players for but, but, something but that these adults in the room should have, you know, strayed away from. It's a it's a smart point. Um, I will say that what happens, and there are people like Jay Billis will say, well, like the NCAA shouldn't get involved. Schools should be able to manage manage themselves. That's the problem is schools cannot. That school that they just they have proven sure. time and again that they are not willing. Uh, they're not willing to do it the right way because they the short-term success is too valuable for them. That's how they build the new stadiums. That's how they get the big donations. They go to the Sugar Bowl. They hit everybody up for donations. They get the big donations. You go on probation, fine. We already got the new building built. It's a good um, point. Uh, but, and, I mean, USC isn't giving a dime back from the Reggie Bush campaign. Right. We almost you know? won three back-to-back-to-back national championships. Right. And, um so I, I do think you talk about adults in the room. It, it is interesting. I think the adults in the room in college sports, period, make bad decisions personally. They make it based upon money, not based M- money upon what the right themselves. things to do. I think commissioners do that. The NCAA does that. Did you know that the actual genesis of the transfer penalty is not in and of itself a penalty? And this this is, again, the language. If you read the NCAA's website, app, actually the website, it's such a wolf in sheep's clothing website. The actual reason for having a player sit out for a a level or parallel transfer in college athletics is so that that, quote unquote, student athlete may get adjusted to their new environment. They pose it as some service to the player. It's such a joke. I mean, just come out and say what it is. You're trying to protect administrations and you're trying to protect head coaches from players leaving. Well, I, and, I, and also, me, I also that, think that's when I have, start getting so frustrated, Doug, I, is, is when the reasonable argument is left on the sideline for some sort of utopian argument that is clearly not reality. I think you're right that it's not reality, but I can... I can combat your argument about why you should absolutely sit out for a year. Plus, I want to ask you, like, who who becomes then the guy at Ole Miss? There, yeah. there are two guys sitting out. Who would who would work the best? Catch the herd from noon to three Eastern on iHeartRadio and FS1. Joel Klatt, who um, I'm told is going to be hosting MLB Whip Around yes. tonight, dusting off the old hosting skills. How about that? Yeah, you used to host um, for um, during the NFL for, yeah. for Fox, right? Yeah, I did at the inception of FS1. I was kind of a utility player, and I would host. And then in in a previous life, when I still lived in Colorado, I would host on Root Sports Rocky Mountain for the Colorado Rockies pregame and postgame shows. And that was back when they were like losing a hundred games a year. So they're they they've obviously improved since I left. I thought they're in Jersey. <laughs> like, how are you going to some like? There's there a studio here in in Greater Los Angeles area you're going to tonight? MLB Whip? No, it's right here. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh no! Oh, oh, MLB Whip Around. Okay, I yeah, was watching. I was watching Network. last night. No, no, no. So my, my bad. MLB I was like, dude, you're doing MLB. Right I forgot. I was watching those guys last night. The studio show with Frank Thomas. I was sitting there staring. There was. I mean, I thought it was really, really good stuff. There you go. Well, I'm gonna go. So and are try you? To bring you it it's gonna be all bit. Nolan Arenado all the time. You go all it. Rockies. That's it. All Rockies. You got Charlie Blackman in there. We discussed beard. Charlie Blackman's beard. There was a kid who goes crazy every time he sees Charlie Blackman. On I love him. it. That's we'll, great. We'll, we'll show it to you. Uh, MLB whip around tonight. Joel Klatt doing hosting duties. I, I love it. Um, so what I was trying to trying to tell you about um, during the break a little bit and before we got to the break was I know everybody hates the idea that you have to sit out. And the NCAA For doesn't. transfer. Tra- when, tra- when you transfer. Right. And I know that the, the way in which they write it up, what, what was, you, you read it to me. Yeah, it's on the NCAA website, it it's essentially says we may require, the NCAA may require you to sit out a year of eligibility so that you can adjust to your new school. 
they pose it as some benefit to you when you're transferring. It's like, just come out and say what it I is. Do it's th- a penalty. I do think that there's an actual benefit to, like, for, for freshmen, I actually think there's a huge benefit to redshirting, uh, which I know Jim Delaney – has the the soon to be did he retire yet or he's soon to be retiring commissioner of the Big Ten has proposed and like some people laughed at it but the truth is that everybody needs an adjustment period when you get to college coming from high school academically and athletically it it won't likely happen but it's not a terrible idea I mean like look basically this is like um, an out out clause it's like you know coaches have buyouts. And the only way to, to keep them close to their school is to put a, a prohibitive buyout. The only way to not have a complete free-for-all where guy plays for, you know, USC one year and then gets recruited off that field and transfers the next year where he has a greater opportunity is to make some sort of penalty for transfer. Oh, listen, I, I agree with you in normal cases. I don't think we should treat transfers all the same. I think there are, are – and I – so I, I – I, I like the fact that you can apply for, let's say, family hardship or a medical type of transfer, those those types of transfers. What I'm saying is that in these cases, in a Baylor case, in a, an Ole Miss case, those players should be able to leave. Okay, Just because the adults in the room have completely screwed up and made mistakes that are going to ultimately – be hardest on me as a player because I'm the one going to bear the postseason ban. I'm the one that's going to bear poor seasons because we cannot recruit moving forward. I'm going to bear that as a player. Therefore, I, I should be able to transfer without penalty. And then the only other transfer that I think should be able to go anywhere at any time is if you earn your degree. That, and that, I understand that, that, that already... kids are earning their degree at, at a, you know, earlier and earlier clip based on graduating high school early, all the summer classes that they take. I understand all of that and they can at this point, but there are still some restrictions. There are a bunch of uh, hoops that you have to uh, jump through. In my, in my world, if you earn your degree, you lived up to your letter of intent responsibility and you should be able to go wherever you want immediately. Uh, Okay. Who would, who's, who would be a better fit at a place like Ole Miss? So you got less and you got chip both sitting out there. Yeah, and and I know that people are going to gravitate towards names like that. I've heard Nate Lane Kiffin's name be thrown around. I've heard Chad Morris uh, get thrown around. I don't think it's that attractive of a job because of the history that we talked about in the last segment. Uh, I know Old Miss fans are going to get really upset about this, but you're in a division that is borderline, at least at this point, unwinnable mm-hmm. uh, with Alabama in there. Um, it's, it's a program that going back a quarter century – has only su- succeeded with cheating, essentially. You with know, the exception while of when, being e- when Eli was there would be when the exception. Eli with David Cutcliffe, but that's a family relationship. Cutcliffe coached Peyton, so on and so forth. That was extenuating circumstances. You can make an argument that it's 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 really only you, you know points of 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 turmoil that they've had success. So I, I think it's going to have to be a guy at a lower level, like a Blake Anderson from Arkansas state or um, uh, Neil Brown from Troy, someone along those lines. I don't think a big name is going to touch this job. The only thing that this job has going for it, literally the only thing is that they're willing to pay everything else outside of that is, is really not enviable from a head coach's standpoint. The one point I would contradict you on is the idea that when teams go on probation, kids all want to leave. A lot of times they want to stay because that means they're going to play even more. Which and while is you great. say they couldn't play in a bowl game, we, we've continued to diminish the values of a bowl game anyway. I, I, I totally understand that. And I, I, my point wasn't, I guess, clear. I don't think that all of them want to leave. It's just but they should if be allowed. you do want to right. leave, you should be allowed. If you want to stay, more power to you, and you're Matt Barkley, and you want to stay at USC. All right, try and get this into MLB whip around tonight when you get to the to the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> Which one? Here's the kid who loves uh, Charlie, Charlie Blackman. Yeah, you got you to check, check this out, if you will. What do we got? This, it's a kid who... Don't you just wish once in your life, like you have three kids, don't you wish once in your life one of your kids would like, it's Joe Clown, yes, it's Daddy. Yes. Oh my it's, gosh, that would be amazing. It, what do the wise guys wear? I get asked that from time to time. The answer is the new gear from the HerdNow.com merchandise store. We are now officially open for business. We have all the apparel diehard Herd fans need to represent the show. Go to the HerdNow.com. If you don't, that's a you problem. And that's a you problem is one of our shirts. Check it out. The HerdNow.com. 
The HerdNow.com store is open for business today.